This is The Michael Bryan Show. Hi everyone, welcome back to the show. And today I'm joined with Thomas Schrock. I hope I've pronounced that name right. Is that right? Yes, it's right. Thank you. <laughs> Get in. That's amazing. First time for everything. And Thomas is the founder and CEO of Natural Gem with a PhD in economics. And for those that don't know, Natural Gem is, is a company all about colored gemstones and Thomas is actually one of the leading experts for naturally colored gemstones in Europe so we're talking all things stones I think and we're going to dive into some NLP and the ways that he grows his companies so it's going to be very very interesting for sure so Thomas thanks for being on the show thank you for the invitation so one of the the first questions that really strong to my mind was what was it about gemstones that captured your imagination or captured you in a way to to cause you to actually turn it into a business well the structure the mineralogy um the beauty the age of the stones uh all together i'm amazed by beautiful gemstones was it mostly a natural thing that you stumbled across or did somebody introduce you? Like, it's not a particularly usual thing in certain parts of the world. It's quite unusual. So how did you actually come across them? Yes, it's unusual. You're right. Um, it's not a family business. When I was eight years old, my father gave me a rock crystal. He was hunting. He brought one rock crystal with him. I was fascinated. And I asked my parents if we can go for just digging or getting some stones from nature. And they did. So for some years, and we went to some fairs, and uh, uh, I got fascinated by cut stones, gemstones. By the age of 12 or 13, I started collecting them. By the age of 15, my father told me, well, that's too expensive. I will not finance that. Uh, just do something. And by incident, I got in contact with an Indian wholesale family. They are just, they are very good friends still today with me, 35 years after that. And by the age of 15, I ordered some gemstones, went to my gemstone dealer in Vienna, sold them, got a good price. And I thought, well, I'm in business. And that was the starting point. And by the age of 20, I opened a jewelry shop. Wow. So it was very much a, a yeah. business venture that you, you came across and realized, hey, I can actually make some money out of this. So what was your first gemstone that, that got you intrigued by the whole thing? Uh, I think the first one uh, by the age of 12 was an aquamarine. That's a burial. It's the sister stone to the emerald. So I think that was one of the first stones. But uh, yeah, some other followed later. <laughs> so what is it about gemstones that relates to... Because I've got a birthstone, I think. It's, um, July is, is my month, which I've, if I'm not mistaken, it's ruby, so I'm told. I could be wrong. So what, why do gemstones relate to, to birthdays? Oh, that's a, that's a long story. Um, the common history of gemstones and the human beings is now documented for 5,000 years. So people, there are a lot of stories about the Queen of Saba on Sri Lanka, uh, about uh, King Solomon and so on. And um, well, in these days, I think the people thought that uh, gemstones bear some magic, something special, some energy or so. And I think um, at some time, I don't know when exactly, gemstones were linked to birthstones, to signs, astrological signs, and so on. Yeah, I think you are right. It's ruby or uh, I think it's ruby for July. Yeah, could be. I don't know exactly. <laughs> so it's always been been quite fascinating, really, because it's one of the more valuable things that we can that we can get from emerald to ruby to a whole host of others that I'm sure you know a lot more about than I do. But what makes them valuable? What's 
the not just the appeal, but is there anything particular about gemstones that makes them valuable? Yeah. Um, one thing, once again, goes back in history. People were always fascinated by the colors, by the sparkling. Uh, if we go to a more scientific, uh, scientific approach it would be they are hard so the the old definition of a gemstone is uh, a hardness of eight or higher eight nine ten eight is emerald nine is ruby ten is diamond so they are hard so people thought that the, these stones are not destroyable that's wrong by the way they are destroyable hardness doesn't mean uh, they cannot be destroyed um, this is two things and uh, third thing I think is all nobility, all kings, queens, emperors started collecting them. And you mentioned it, there is nothing in the world which has so much value in a small space. If you take a ruby five carat high quality from Mozambique, from East Africa, uh, well, you are around 100,000 pounds, 120,000, 150,000 dollars. So that's quite a lot of money. So it's a, I think it's a combination between hardness, they are rare, um, they stand for a lot of money, and they stand for power. Because you mentioned Ruby. Ruby is also uh, connected with Mars, Mars energy. That means power, fire. Um, Ruby was always the, the stone of the emperors. To, um, in China, only the emperor was and his family was allowed to wear red stones, rubies. So I think all of these things together make it up, the fascination. <laughs> it's good to know that uh, my birthstone is related to being an emperor. I might, I might, have to, uh, might have to ride that out a little bit. So I should be an emperor because my, my birthstone's ruby. I'm sure I'll get a, a lot of jokes from that from some of the listeners that, uh, that will reach out to me about that. <laughs> So a lot of the value comes from the rarity and how hard they are. And what stories do you have about gems? Because Ruby and Emperor seems pretty cool, right? Are there any particular unusual stories related to a particular gemstone? Well, there are a lot of stories. Um, if you go back to in history, the biggest part of rubies at this time, if we start with a ruby, came from uh, East India. But East India at that time is today Burma, is Myanmar. Yeah? So also in India, you had some rubies, you had blue sapphires down there in Sri Lanka, Ceylon. And so the Maharajas in India, they had a lot of uh, blue stones, sapphires, and red stones, rubies, but they had no green. And when the Europeans went to Colombia, to Brazil, uh, 15th century, they found a lot of green stones, emeralds. So they brought the stones on their ships back to Europe. Now the kings, queens, emperors, and so on in Europe had a lot of green stones, but no red stones. So they exchanged them via Istanbul with the Maharajas. From the east, you got blue and red stones. From the west, there came the green stones. That's why you find today in Istanbul, in the Dobkapi, a lot of emeralds from Colombia, because they just used the road from Europe direction to India. And on the other hand side, you have a lot of rubies in the European treasuries as they came from India. So this is one of the stories. Uh, second story, well, there are a lot of famous stones. Um, famous diamonds, famous rubies. Who be, some of the rubies we have today have a history of 1,500 years. And sometimes we know who were the owners of the stones. And that makes them once again more powerful and more valuable. In the gemstone business, if you have just a nice stone, let's say the stone has a value of 100%. But if this stone belonged one day to Marie Antoinette of French Empire, or it belonged to the Windsor family, or it belonged to the Romanov in Russia, then the price goes up three times, four times, ten times, because stories are always uh, fascinate people. And yeah, these stones are very valuable. How do you connect the dots for the story to the actual stone? Do you have to 
go to libraries or historical records? And what's the process for uncovering the history of stone? You're right. Uh, number one is if somebody, a lady or a gentleman, wears it on a, on a painting. Uh, in the 15th century and early 14th, 13th century, the biggest stone often were used in rings for men. So paintings are very important. Then number two, if you have a famous family like Romanov in Russia, like uh, Habsburg in Austria, like Windsor in Great Britain, uh, then you have all the books, what they owned. And the famous stones were always in the books because they were expensive. So it was written, the family uh, bought this stone from blah, blah, for the amount of blah, blah, and so on. And some of the families, they keep it still, Windsor, poor England. And uh, there is the full story of all the stones they have, still in their books. Habsburg in Austria, we know a lot of, about it because Habsburg ruled Austria 700, almost 700 years. So, and most of the books were still well, are still surviving. Romanov was a little bit more shaky, you know, the revolution and so on. But on the one hand side, book, uh, books, uh, paintings, libraries, as you mentioned them, um, yeah, it's a mixture. Have you ever had to, I guess, discredit, a, it's the wrong way of putting it, but have you ever got the stone wrong? Have you ever sort of thought this was like a, a valuable stone come from a royal family perhaps and it turned out not to be the case it was something different because it must be difficult to pinpoint the actual stone so have you ever have you ever got it wrong well i do not know many cases like that because if we are talking about such stones these are not small stones they are quite huge yeah like the koinor if you to mention a big diamond or big rubies um, if you have a ruby or a, let's say a ruby of 30 carat, one carat is 0 0.2 grams or other terms, one gram, uh, five carats. Um, and if you have a 30 carat ruby of high quality, well, there is nothing to uh, make it wrong because these stones are so rare. Yeah, uh, that's nobody would give a 30 carat ruby just to say, OK, this belongs to Charles Manie the Great. Yeah, because it doesn't make sense. If you have a sapphire, blue sapphire of 100 or 200 carat, it's a lot of money. So the same thing. Yeah, uh, Some of the stones were lost in time. That's right. Yeah? We have one of the biggest stones of the Austrian Empire was the so-called Florentine. It was a 100 carat diamond, lightly grayish, yellowish stone. And as the emperor fleed Austria in 1918, and later on, 1919 to 21, he sold this stone to a, to a businessman in Switzerland. And this stone, we don't know, was it stolen? Was it sold? It's not clear today. And this guy cut the stones in different diamonds. So this stone is lost. That's the other way around. The story is there. That we know how it looked like and what it was, but it's lost. So the other very is very, very rare that you have a big stone and it is just given for a famous stone. No, I wouldn't say that happens often. <laughs> what do you do with the stones? Do you just collect them? Do you sort of have some kind of museum where people are allowed to observe them, take pictures, that sort of thing? Like what, what do you do with the stones once you have them? Um, depends on the person. My company today, we sell them as a diversification. If somebody is quite wealthy or rich, people have other uh, commodities. They have gold, they have their houses and so on. And then they say, okay, apart from gold, I want to have something small, which is valuable just to diversify my fortune. A small part of our customers wants to wear it. Yeah, I have one US American customer, she says, uh, below $500,000 $500, on my fingers, I'm naked. So right. that's the other way to see it. And um, I would say 80% of our stones just go to vaults, never seen again mostly. 20% are in jewelry set. Some people collect them and like to watch them. Me, myself, I like to watch them. I have my own collection, but we do not have a museum. 
company. Right. So what stone do you have that because you, you get access to a lot of different stones over the years. Do you have any personal favorites? Well, uh, honestly, Ruby. <laughs> <laughs> what are the chances? Sorry, sorry to say. Um, that has many reasons. A ruby has a beautiful color. If it's a real rich red, a deep red without inclusions, it's a beautiful stone. Secondly, um, ruby hard, rubies hardly get big. Um, if you have a ruby, one carat, and you have a, sec a second one, which is two carats, a two carat is never twice the price of a one carat. It's usually four to six times higher. So if you go up to six carat, eight carat, it gets really, really rare. So for me, because Earth, our Earth is uh, the production of rubies, works in that way that ruby is aluminium dioxide. You need aluminium and you need oxide. Well, this combination is quite often on Earth, but then you need chrome oxide. Chrome oxide together with this aluminium dioxide is very, very rare. In reality, we find them in a clean stone type. We find them along the Himalaya. That means from Burma to Afghanistan to Tajikistan. And we find them in East Africa, especially Mozambique, Madagascar, Tanzania. Um, that's it. In Greenland, we have a very, very small uh, source of them. So they are rare. They are beautiful, um, they're hard, nine, and it comes now back to energy and uh, a little bit of esoteric uh, purposes. Uh, they are connected to Mars and to power. So I like the color, I like the stone. Then secondly, I like emeralds because a beautiful green emerald, a deep green, which is still sparkling with a little bit of inclusions, we call them Chardin, which is French, which means the garden inside. And that's very poetic. The garden you find inside an emerald. So emeralds are softer than rubies, but the beauty, if it's really green, it's beautiful. Well, that's that's great. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can just picture you've got some kind of rainbow with, with gemstones in some kind of case somewhere. It must be must be very... I guess, um, I don't want to say exciting, but very reassuring or peaceful from looking at something like that because it gives you a sense of, you know, the story and you can really connect with a stone, probably more so than a couple of other things that other people might spend their money on. Yeah, you're right. It is... Um... It's on the one hand side, it's it's beautiful to have just a, a lot of stones in front of you and to look at them. Uh, I had a friend, a very good one. He was an Australian miner. He mined sapphires, blue sapphires. And he said to me one day, um, if I'm depressed, if I'm not feeling well, I open my vault, just put out the stones, look at them, and then I'm happy. <laughs> And uh, yeah, it can be a rainbow collection from its all colors. And it's also the beauty, what nature, what the earth uh, produces for us. That's beautiful. When I was growing up, there was a bit of a, a rumor around diamonds, whereby the value is somewhat created, whether, it, whether it's on purpose or otherwise, where they don't mine it as much as they could they don't sort of do that process as much as they could so they kind of make the make it valuable on purpose to a certain degree and they make and they make it as part of rings and jewelries and they attach it to say anniversaries and things of that nature so they've somewhat orchestrated the the value of diamonds is that is that actually true or not it is true yeah we say in the industry, we say the diamond had this had the biggest and best marketing of all gemstones. Uh, the biggest uh, mining company one day was De Beers. Um, it was founded in what we call today Zimbabwe, which um, was uh, the company was founded by Cecil Rhodes, 
Yeah. And um, they had a market share at the beginning, I think, of 70 to 80 percent of the world market. Because imagine, we speak about the 19th century, the diamonds are discovered in Africa. And at this time, almost all diamonds of the world came from India. Now you discover a new source and this source provides you with a large amount of diamonds. So uh, there was the beers. Uh, they were the founders of big mines and they had a lot of stones. Then in the US, we have a big jewelry company, which is called Tiffany's. Tiffany's was very good or is still very good in marketing. So I think somehow they found together and said, okay, let's do all the story building you mentioned now regarding anniversary rings, engagement rings, and so on. So it was very good, <clears throat> sorry, very good marketing. And um, yes, I agree. Today, three big companies, DPS is one of them. There is another one and a Russian one. They have together, I think, 77 to 80% of the world share of rough diamonds. And you are right. Diamonds are much less rare than people think. They are much more often to be found. So we find them today in Canada. We find them in Namibia, Sierra Leone, uh, Zimbabwe still, South Africa, of course, and so on. So the treasuries, the stocks are full of diamonds. And most of the diamonds, they go into the jewelry industry. So what we saw in 2008, that means financial crisis, and what we saw in the COVID crisis 2020 was a downswing in prices of diamonds because jewelry industry went down because people bought less jewelry, so diamond prices went down. This was one of the reasons why I, I started with this idea of investment stones in 2008 during the financial crisis. My idea was not to put too many um, diamonds, white diamonds in the, in the market because I had the feeling they could go down. So I went to the colored stone market as, as we say it and the most important ones you mentioned them is ruby, red, blue sapphire and emerald green. And uh, you mentioned that at the beginning we are specialized and I'm fascinated by uh, so-called natural colored stones. That means around the year uh, 100 after Christ. That means we are speaking about the Roman Empire, the first century uh, of our uh, time frame, which we use. Um, the demand for high quality gemstones was higher this time than the quantity which was delivered, supplied by nature. So there are a lot of stories. Uh, I don't know if they are true, doesn't matter. Uh, that one day a guy put a blue sapphire into an oven and heated it uh, up to 1,700 degrees Celsius, quite a high temperature. And the stone changed the color, it improved. And also optically, the quantity of inclusions decreased just for the human eye. They were, they were still there, but the, for the human eye, it was, the stone was improved. So we started to improve, let's say, stones by heating. Later on, by filling with uh, glass, by uh, later on radiation, and so on. So my guess today, and I'm not alone with this, that if you go to a jewelry shop, and it doesn't matter if it is Frankfurt, if it's London, or if it's New York, and you put on the table, let's say $20,000, and you say, I want to have a nice ruby ring for my girlfriend, for engagement, the probability that this stone, this ruby is not natural color is 97% at the moment. That means 97% of the jewelry quality is treated today. We call it treated. Mostly it's heated. The jeweler, if you buy it, should tell you, hey, that's treated, but usually it's not done. We have the CBO, which is the International Organization for Gemstone Traders and Jewelers, and there we have rules. And one of the rules is you should inform the customer that this is not original color. So biggest part of the whole market is treated. And I decided that I want to deal just with so-called natural stones. That means the stone is so beautiful. You find the ruby in Mozambique or in Burma. You just put it out of earth. You cut it. You certify it. That means international laboratories in gemology and you sell the stone. And this is my business today. 
And by one incident more, it was not my genius, it was to some degree luck. In t- up from uh, 2010, the big auction houses like Sotheby's and uh, Christie's started to divide the whole products they sell, the auction, in non-treated stones and treated stones. So if you open an auction catalog, uh, catalog by Sotheby's and you just read ruby, ring, ruby, three carat, diamonds, one carat, 10 grams of gold makes 20,000 Swiss francs. So that means that the stone is treated. Just if they mention uh, ruby, no indication of treatment, of heating, and they have a lab report of an international lab, then the stone is unheated or untreated. And you will see that there's a big price difference. The treated stones are much cheaper. The natural colored stones are much more expensive. Thanks for breaking that down as well, Thomas. I think a lot of people that want to make sure that what they're getting is is high quality. I like that you you broke it down for us. So if you're listening and you want to know, you may have to go back and and re listen to that part because uh, I can't repeat it because I don't I don't know the same things that Thomas does. It's fascinating that the the story has actually been created and the scenario has been manufactured to a certain degree regarding some gemstones and it's just interesting because I've always been a bit skeptical of of marketing anyway just because of my own experience but it's good to hear from yourself that you know it has been sort of created by the those that have the higher market share you know if they can manipulate it they'll obviously profit as a result of it so with that said what actually is, if you know, by the way, this is a complete curveball now, do you know what the rarest gemstone is? What's the hardest to access and the least amount that people can actually mine and get hold of? You mean the rarest gemstone in the world? Um, well, that's hard to answer. There are several very, very rare stones. Mm, I would like to mention a red burial. Burial is emerald. And there is one version where the stone gets red, not green as usual. This stone was in earlier days was called big spit. Nowadays, we just call it red burial. Very, very rare, very expensive, hard to get. I never had one, by the way. I never traded one. Uh, I saw one once, I think. And uh, another stone to mention, let's go to the diamond side. You know, there are white diamonds that are the usual jewelry stones. And there are so-called fancy diamonds or colored diamonds. They are colored by nature. You find yellow diamonds, orange, um, green, blue, purplish, red, um, gray, color-changing diamonds. That's all produced by nature. And the rarest one of all these stones is the red one. Really red stones, there are stories about it. Red diamonds, I'm sorry. Uh, red diamonds in the world, there's the story that there shall be seven to ten pieces around the world. And purchasing price of such a stone per carat shall be three to five million dollars. So 0.2 grams is equal to three to five million dollars. Um, yeah, it is, this stone is produced as a red diamond by nature. When the crystal grit shifts, that means the stone, you know, diamonds, they need a high pressure, they need high temperature down into earth. And during building up the stone, the crystal grit itself can shift. And if it shifts a little bit, the stone gets pinkish. And if it shifts a lot, it gets red. And this is a very rare movement down in earth. So this stone is very, very rare. Wow. Amazing. It's it, it's fascinating how the rarity can be created by the earth itself as well. That's that's amazing. That's almost incredible to know that the earth can do some amazing things and even things that don't happen all that often, you know, it is it is fascinating how it affects the colors. So is it rarity that causes people to treat it? If if the colors can be 
incredible naturally? Is it the fact that it is rare that causes people to to treat it instead of just let it occur naturally? Right. You're completely right. Because people want to have a beautiful blue sapphire, maybe of 10 carat. And, um, well, maybe people cannot afford a natural one. So a treated one can be the solution of it. Um, so I think that's it. Yeah, you're right. Right. It's, it's crazy to think that it's kind of a, a cycle almost because we can say that it's the industry, but then if someone wants one, there's the natural inclination to provide it for people that want it. So is it, in your opinion, obviously, is it the desire or is it the industry? Like what, what do you think sort of building that picture for people? It's both. It's both. It's the industry on the one hand side with very good marketing, with uh, the idea that people should wear, why is not important due to some reason, should wear nice jewelry. Uh, that's the one hand side. On the other hand side is desire. I want to have something sparkling, something beautiful, and maybe I can get it cheaper than the usual price would be. Otherwise, you wouldn't have the discussion at the moment which we have about synthetic diamonds. Yeah, they were introduced five to ten. I mean, I mean, uh, economically they were introduced, not scientifically. Yeah, they were introduced to the market five to ten years ago. Whereas synthetic ruby, synthetic sapphire, synthetic emerald was uh, introduced 1875-1880 at this time. So it's desire, it's desire to wear something which is beautiful. Also to maybe impress people by the uh, sparkling ring, a red ring on my finger. Yeah, maybe you. In earlier days, maybe somebody saw the king or the emperor with a big jewel, and then another person of nobility or of a citizen, not of nobility, came to the idea: I want to have something like that. But the big stone is rare. I want to have something affordable. Well, the industry provides it. And here we are. That makes perfect sense when you think about it, isn't it? Because the desire has to come from somewhere. You know, it's, it's rare that desire just randomly appears. So it could be a combination of marketing and then it, the desire sort of breeds the, the process to meet demand, I suppose. I know that there's another thing that you are quite passionate about as well, Thomas, and that's businesses and managing people and leadership and getting the most out of your your staff and the companies that you, you spend a lot of time in. So correct me if I'm wrong, but you're also quite fascinated with something like NLP. Am I right in saying that? You're right. Uh, I would take it a little, the picture a little bit bigger. I'm fascinating, fascinated by how people communicate and how people think, how they create their life, their way of thinking and NLP, neuro-linguistic programming, as we want to mention it, um, was one toolbox, nothing but a toolbox to discover how people communicate and to improve the own communication. So what are some of the most interesting things that you've come across regarding how people communicate? Is there anything in particular that stands out? Let's take a, a, a guy who is depressed, what we call depressed. Yeah, um, We have a we, I mean, we from coming from NLP have a completely different view in comparison to medicine or psychiatry. We say each and every person has a strategy to create his or her life. Yeah. So depression is, if I want to take that, is just a way how people live their lives. They haven't learned to do it in a different way. They have not found another strategy to live the life, their life. So if you can tell them this, a new strategy, you can learn them, teach them how to live it. 
it changes life. And uh, yeah, and, and our thinking completely uh, influences our body, our mind. So in the long run, people are what they think and how they think in the long run, not in the short run. One of the things that really fascinated me about it was this idea of the placebo effect in some ways regarding language. So language, essentially, it's sort of a placebo effect in that it doesn't exist in of itself until we make it mean something. So I, I, I could say something to you and it won't mean anything to you and won't impact you in the same way as if I use your language and I say something that's important to you that has a bigger effect but to somebody else that might not have mm -hmm. the same effect in, in exactly the same way and what I found interesting was negativity has an impact on the body just by saying the words even if it's not important. So what I just said then, it completely contradicts what I said if it's negative, because negative has this natural lowering of like your energy levels, your emotional state, your power output, because I did this sort of thing of negativity can reduce how strong you are, let's say physically, where positivity naturally increases it almost ir irrespective of what you actually said to the person obviously the difference is higher if you tell them something that hits them quite hard if it's positive then the jump up is a lot more than you know if it was just a, a bit more meaningless shall we say so that's what really fascinated me in that they're just words but they still affect you physically because you take it in. We're not robots, are we? We, we do take in words. We do take in language, whether we like it or not. That's why, for instance, I used to feel quite bad if I got negative feedback, let's say, even if I'm like trying to process it and get past it and not let it impact me. I used to feel bad that I'd tell myself everything was fine or I'd tell myself it didn't matter, but it did. I can feel it having the effect on me physically, even though mentally I'm trying to talk myself out of, of feeling bad. You know, we all have that thing of like, you don't want it to happen, but it still is. And you tend to not have much of a, a choice in the matter. You know, you kind of sit there going, I'm fine, I'm fine, everything's fine. But it's not. You can feel it still like pecking away at your brain to a certain degree. So that was always quite fascinating to me. And it helped me way back when I had this sort of mini realization as well of almost acceptance. You have to sort of accept that that's what the process is and i found that actually helps you get through it quicker like if you try to hold on to the process to a certain degree that can slow it down and you end up dragging it out much longer than longer than it actually needed to be what's your take on something like that and, and positivity versus negativity well first all words we use in all languages are labels we have learned to use these labels. It doesn't matter if it's English, if it's Russian, or if it's German. We have just learned this, that these labels have an impact to us. This is just one important point. To take everything what the person is telling you is just a label. This person, this special person, uses or has a strategy, to use this word once again, has learned a strategy to use such a label on you, number one. Number two... It's a little bit technical. Um, it depends on your own programs you are running, how you live, how you do your communication, how you communicate in total. That means some people take feedback very personal. They take it in and uh, they cannot um, distinguish between a feedback, which is just feedback, and the personality. So this is completely, once again, part of a strategy that this person, one person has learned, okay, it's feedback, great, I will improve. Uh, um, that's a little bit the US American way of thinking. Um, I will improve, thank you very much for the feedback, I go on. 
And the other person thinks or starts thinking, well, what's it wrong with me? He's not satisfied. She doesn't like me and so on. She takes it personally. So this is a little bit more, I would say, the European way, how to think in very often, in very many cases. Yeah. So it's up to the person. It's, it's also part of learnings to deal with such a feedback and just to find the point where you say, okay, that's just the opinion of this person. Uh, I decide if I integrate it. If I say, yes, person is right. I want to learn something. Let's go ahead. I learn something. Or you just say to yourself, oh, no, no, just opinion of this person. Leave it there. This person has his or her own history. Okay, will be part of her or his history. It's not part of mine, not part of my life. Okay, bye-bye. Yeah. So it depends how you deal with feedback. Feedback itself is something very positive. We wouldn't learn without feedback. If nobody would tell us, hey, there was a problem in grammar, uh, please improve. Well, we wouldn't improve. On the other hand side, you are right. Uh, feedback can be destroying. And in NLP, one of the most important things we tell people is divide um, feedback on behavior. That's okay. I always can feedback behavior and tell somebody, please change it. I don't like it. It's my opinion. I don't like. Please do it in a different way if you communicate with me. That's Always okay, always right. And the other way, which is the destroying one, never give negative feedback on a person. I mean, personally, you can say, Mrs. Miller, I don't like how you greeted in the morning our customer, please improve it tomorrow. I want to have it good morning and in a good mood. But never tell somebody, Mrs. Miller, you are silly. Because this would be a direct uh, conflict with this person. So we can always ask people to change behavior, but we never uh, criticize people for what they are and which person they are. When I used to be a tennis coach, one of the things I had to learn, and this was a bit of a learning curve for me, if I'm being brutally honest with you, Thomas, is when you give positive feedback or compliments, one of the first things that you do is you want to complement an aspect of their personality. So let's say they try because when I was a tennis coach, it took a lot of determination and focus and commitment to to learning the skill. And it's a combination of you give positive feedback on their efforts or how hard they've worked, but then you bring up something that's relevant to what they've done obviously. So it could be their ability to concentrate. They spent a whole coaching session on one particular thing. That takes focus, determination, concentration. They don't bore easy, right? I'd be bored if I just spend like two hours on the same thing. They're the kinds of things that you want to compliment people on because they'll take those traits into other areas. That was fascinating to me. So if I was to say, um, you, know, you spent so long working, let's say you're serving tennis as one of the, the sports that I did used to coach. And so you, you, I could tell you were really focusing on that one particular thing. Your ability to concentrate for so long was amazing. You just hit serves, then you picked up tennis balls and you went straight back to serves again. You didn't ask to do something different. You didn't complain that you were bored. That was amazing how you were able to focus for so long. And I also like the fact that you improved gradually over the course of the session. Amazing job. Well done, right? Then if we did something different, they would do the same thing. They would work on it until it got better. They wouldn't say they were bored. They wouldn't complain. They would still focus on it and still get better. Because one of the things I realized was it's a bit of a meta skill, I think you would call it, or like a foundational trait that helps with everything. And that completely changed the way I coached. A lot harder. You've got to be extremely thoughtful. Your brain has to operate pretty quickly to connect the dots in in how them as a person 
has helped them get better at the sport. It's kind of like you're coaching the person and the sport benefits as a result rather than just coaching them on the sport. It's so much easier to coach them on the sport than to coach the person as a human. It's so much more difficult, but the results were amazing. Is that something that you've experienced as well? Yes, I completely agree. If a person improves, um, well, we call it a, a question of motivation. There are different ways how a people, how somebody motivates him or herself. Um, secondly, uh, there are the so-called values. Values means uh, it's not a common term. A value means um, something which motivates a person to do something or not to do it. So if you mention your coaching or your way of coaching the person, it changes the motivation of the person and it maybe puts the value up in hierarchy a little bit. So in a positive way, the sports benefits, it improves. Or in the, if we want to take it, I have to do a lot with people who have symptoms, different symptoms. That's the other way around. You can choose to work with a symptom. Maybe it gets better. Beautiful. Yeah. Great. great. The person feels better, goes out. And after two days, she comes back and says, well, I'm feeling bad again. So if you change the behavior, the thinking of the person, the symptom is decreased. And the other way around, if you have it in a positive mood and positive way, if you coach the person regarding motivation, regarding uh, well-being, in regard of what she or he is doing, the sports or the skill she he is trained improves as well. It's the same if you train something somebody professionally. I mean, for the job they are doing, it's the same. That makes perfect sense, actually, because it it sometimes takes longer to coach the person than it does to simply go in and fix the problem at a slightly more surface level. Sometimes it can take a bit longer to get them to change as as a person as opposed to going right, just change your behavior and it'll happen a bit quicker because it's easier, I suppose. It's easy to just go in and change your behavior and teach them a different way of doing things rather than, you know, try to get them to be a bit more em- empathetic to customers as, as, as an example. It's, it's a longer process, isn't it? Absolutely, because there are several aspects of it. One of the aspects uh, I would tell people is focus on what you want. Do not focus on what you do not want. In our culture, many people tell you what they do not want. So they do not want to lose the job, do not want to lose the partner, um, and so on. So you have to learn, you have to teach them how to focus on the right things they really want. Number one is get clear what you want, what you really want. And number two is focus on what you want. Um, Secondly, also that has a little bit to to do with boundaries. Enforce your boundaries. Many people um, destroy or violate their boundaries by themselves. When If they do something they do not want to do because... They say, I owe it to my family, I owe it to my partner, I owe it to my company, but I don't like. Yeah. So in this case, you could work on a skill or on a symptom as long as you want, no change. Yeah. Uh, here we have the second part, the other side of the, of the coin is to teach them to enforce boundaries to other people. Just not only to do what other people, people want but also to tell people hey stop it i don't like that i'm a human being i have a personality and i'm just i and i do not like what you do stop it so it's a mixture of focus on what you want in your life or in your partnership or whatever it is number two enforce your boundaries and number three the way of motivation is it more towards to something Or is it a way from just telling people or yourself what you do not want? And our unconscious mind cannot read the small and little word 
low. That means uh, don't drop the plate increases the chance that the plate drops by roughly 70 to 80%. Because the unconscious mind cannot understand the word don't or no. So that means you increase probabilities by telling people uh, what they shall not do. In hypnosis, we even use that if you tell somebody, do not relax now completely. So they immediately go into trance because the conscious mind still um, processes the term do not relax completely now. So because the unconscious mind says, okay, conscious mind, unconscious mind, okay, what is it, what he's saying? Do not to relax, not now, not completely. So still stopped. And that means the, the trance starts in, comes in, sleeps in, and the the person in front of me goes into a form of trance. And if it's a little bit improved, it goes in direction of hypnosis. Yeah. So, well, it has to do with focus, what you want to do, focus on, on what you want, not what you not want, and um, enforce your boundaries. So that would be the first steps to coach a person. It doesn't make a different difference if I train the person for or to become a member of the board of a big company, or in your case, uh, a performer in tennis, a better player in tennis. That's very, very well said. And actually a fantastic place to, to finish the conversation, Thomas. It's been fantastic, very, very fascinating. And I was actually surprised when you said the other side of the coin. I thought you'd be the other side of the ruby or the diamond or something, but you said the other side of the coin. So I was kind of like, oh, okay, maybe the maybe he doesn't uh he's, maybe there isn't another side of a a diamond because the way it's shaped i just sort of play that voice in my in my mind a little bit really 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 grateful that you came on the show thomas where can people find out more about you is there everything from natural gem to maybe another company as well that i know that you're a part of well yeah you find me in the internet just put into the internet thomas shrug that is one possibility that's the easiest one and you find uh, some companies i have the honor to lead and to work with every day uh yeah i would be happy to get in touch if some people have questions um thank you very much for having me it was a pleasure thank you for the invitation no problem at all thomas and for those that are listening if you're new to the show please make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any of our future episodes and if you like the show feel free to share it on social media tag myself and thomas and tell us what you thought i shall see you again on the next episode